Hey everyone, important PSA before we get into today's episode. First, it's super long. The original recording was like an hour and a half and we had to really trim it down. So it might be a little stuttery at times and you might see it's a little bit trimmed in certain areas. Just so you know, because of that, some random things we say might not make much sense because we cut out the context. Like um, I might've gone on a big tangent about Dictator Henry. And so we might casually bring up Dictator Henry here and there. And you might be like, what the hell are they talking about? Normally Nate handles his own audio because he's better at doing that than I am. But I had to take over his audio this week. And so there will be differences today. I tried to make sure the levels were accurate, but it might be a little bit off regarding how things sound. Also, thanks for working with the production delays. Um, we had to skip last week, and so we had a big week this week. And some of you unironically think this is some kind of conspiracy or something that we're manipul- I'm not kidding, that we're manipulating you. I wish I could say we had that much control of the situation. Nate has not had a working computer the last month, and so I've been taking over the edits every weekend. And now Nate has tried to edit with a different NLE, and it's caused a lot of problems. The NLE really acted up on us. And now I still had to take over the end part of the edit to kind of like bring this all together after hours of troubleshooting, trying to get this figured out. So thanks for working with all the restrictions. We're trying our best to still deliver this. And thank you all for watching and enjoy. Can eight RTX 4090 GPUs crack your password? Is WhatsApp more secure than iMessage? Meta thinks so. And Reddit got a Tor Onion site. Welcome to Surveillance Report 108, where we're dedicated to keeping you private and secure with the latest news in the past week. I'm Henry from TechLore. I'm Nathan from The New Oil. And guess what time it is? It's promo segment time. Join us on Patreon where you get exclusive monthly perks. And also it's the best place to support us because we get to see all your donations and we get to plan ahead and we can make decisions back here about how we can better manage funds and all of that good stuff. This is completely free. And so any support that you give us really helps a lot. If you don't like Patreon and you just want to support us privately, we also have Monero down in the description for just one-time payments. We see all of those and we really appreciate them. Also, I forgot last week to post the ADB command in a description for people who are concerned about the Android VPN leaks. So I'm updating last week and this week's video and podcast to include that in the description. So you'll see that down in the description below and you'll see it last week. Okay, we're gonna start off with our highlight story, which the headline says eight RTX 4090s can break passwords in under an hour. So as is usual with uh, stories like this, there's a lot of context there, you know, it depends on the kind of password and stuff like that. And also we looked it up before the episode started and RTX 4090s are, what did we say? Like 2,700 a piece or 2,300 a piece, depending on which ones you get. So not exactly a cheap rig. Yeah, so this is new research that uh, basically is comparing GPUs. Uh, for those of you who don't know, GPUs are really powerful these days, graphics cards, and a lot of the time they're more powerful than the processors, which means that th that's one of the reasons they're so popular for like mining cryptocurrency and stuff. And that means that they can also be used with password cracking software to beef it up and give it more capabilities. So they did some research into how powerful the 4090 is. Basically, I think the previous version was the 3090, if I remember correctly. And they were just, originally they're just doing a comparison. Like they've done this before with the 3090 and now they're like, hey, let's give it a shot and let's see how this new one stacks up. I'm gonna quote the article. Essentially, this means that any wealthy gamer sporting the RTX 4090 can crack an average password in a matter of days, and that's if you follow good password setting practices, and most of us definitely don't, unquote. So there's a couple of caveats there. Um, number one, the article explicitly says that an average password is an eight character password. And that's, that's just statistically. Uh, we know from past data breaches and stuff like that, generally passwords are eight characters a piece for most people. The quote that I just quoted kind of implies that even a good password of like 16 characters is at risk. I, I don't think that's what they mean. I think they mean like even if your eight character password is like uppercase, lowercase, letters, numbers, things like that, or special characters, numbers, things like that. But yeah, it's really interesting. So they, they also go on to state that the RTX 4090 can reduce the cost of guessing passwords, though they didn't really go into detail. They linked an external blog post that has more details if you're interested about that theory. So I think the real takeaway here is that password cracking is getting easier, it's getting cheaper, it's getting better as technology gets better. So you have to use good passwords, you have to future-proof your passwords, and also 2FA whenever possible, because, you know, I don't. as far as I know, that isn't getting brute forced anytime soon. Yeah, 2FA, pass keys if you can. And this is a great selling point for password managers. If you're on a password manager, you can just have a 120 character password for most of your accounts if you really wanted to. I mean, at that point, then you have to assume that the company's actually entering all 120 characters, but you know, 
still, yeah, it takes the work out of it for sure. While that wraps up highlight story, let's go into data breaches. And we're gonna start with the carousel data breach. Info from 2.6 million accounts allegedly sold on the dark web on hacking forums. This is from Singapore. Carousel is an online marketplace which has about 2 million users affected and notified. They blame it on a bug introduced during a system migration that has since been fixed. This includes usernames, first and last names, email addresses, mobile phone numbers, country of origin, date of account creation, and number of followers. This does not include credit card or payment related data. Also, I didn't mention at the beginning, but we have a ton of data reaches, so we're going to be ripping through these. Our next one comes from Woolworths, who said 2.2 million MyDeal customers' details were exposed in a data breach. So MyDeal is also an online shopping site, which is owned by Woolworths. This included names, email addresses, phone numbers, delivery addresses, and dates of birth for age-required purchases such as alcohol. In the case of 1.2 million customers, only the email address was exposed. So about half of them only had that exposed, which is great. C-Tickets is a ticketing service provider, and they have disclosed a two-and-a-half-year-long credit card theft breach. This was the result of a mage cart attack. And according to the breach notification filed with the attorney general's office, the breach was discovered in April, 2021 when an investigation began, but it wasn't fixed until January 8th, 2022. The initial infection began way back in June 25th, 2019 though. This includes full names, physical addresses, payment card numbers, expiration dates, and CVV numbers. What was not included was social security numbers, ID numbers, and bank information. People registered to use C tickets when they were already breached. Just to give everyone a little bit of something to just think about when you sign up for your next account. You don't know if you're signing up for an already compromised account when you join. So again, just avoid opening accounts if you can. If you have to open it, hand over as little information as possible because you just don't know what's gonna happen. And for the information you do have to hand over, alias information as much as possible. Our next data breach comes from Advocate Aurora Health, which is a 26 hospital healthcare system in Wisconsin and Illinois. And they are claiming a data breach due to the Metapixel has hit 3 million patients. It was caused by quote unquote improper use of the Metapixel. And the data included IP addresses, dates, times, and locations of scheduled appointments, proximity to an Aurora, or excuse me, Advocate Aurora Health location, medical provider information, type of appointment or procedure, communications between users, which may include first and last names and medical record numbers, insurance info, and proxy account information. Patients are being advised to use the uh, tracker blocking features in their web browsers, which uh, Chrome, by the way, the most popular web browser, doesn't have any such features, or to use incognito mode. Um, I think they have since removed the Metapixel. I didn't make a note of that, but I'm pretty sure they have. We've kind of seen this in the past. Other healthcare systems have realized how bad the Metapixel is and have removed it, and they're treating it like a data breach, which is good. We need to start treating Facebook like the freaking malware that it is. So, yeah. Microsoft breach may have affected 65,000 companies in 111 countries. This was a misconfigured Azure blob, which was secured after being notified by researchers on September 24th. It exposed names, email addresses, email content, company names, phone numbers, and files linked to business between affected customers and Microsoft or an authorized Microsoft partner. No indication that customer accounts or systems were compromised, and the researchers claim the data belonged to more than 65,000 companies worldwide, but Microsoft claims this number is greatly exaggerated. Thomson Reuters, a multinational media conglomerate, left an open database with sensitive customer and corporate data, including third-party server passwords in plain text formats. And this was an Elasticsearch database that was, again, not password protected, leaked at least three terabytes of said sensitive data. This is kind of a different data breach than usual. So uh, it, it wasn't like usernames, pa well, it was usernames and passwords, but it wasn't like the usual stuff like that. Uh, it was a wide variety of data from credentials to access third-party servers, SQL logs, and much, much more. A wide variety of data that can be abused in a wide variety of ways. Verizon has notified prepaid customers that their accounts were breached. An unauthorized third party was able to obtain the last four of card payment information and use that to social engineer SIM swapping attacks on Verizon prepaid customers. The number of impacted customers was not disclosed and Verizon has since blocked this compromise and reset account security code pins as an additional step. Names, phone numbers, billing addresses, price plans, and other service related info may have also been compromised. This was likely crypto related because SIM swaps like this usually don't happen on a mass scale. Metabank now says hackers accessed all of its customers' personal data. Cyber criminals, not hackers. So Metabank is an Australian insurance firm, health insurance, I believe. They were breached last week. They said that no data had been accessed. And now they're saying that, whoops, we're wrong. All of it was. Um, to be fair, 
I don't think they're intentionally lying about this stuff. I think they're intentionally choosing to be over-optimistic, but I don't think they're purposely going out there and saying, we know everything was breached, but we're going to tell everybody it wasn't. They're going out there and saying, we're hoping nothing was breached. And now that we're getting the investigation, they're saying, okay, it turns out everything was. So, because best case scenario, nothing was breached and they're telling the truth. But anyways, so this data included pretty much everything. Um, all MetaBank patient information, international students, MetaBank customers, personal data, and significant amounts of health claims. So yeah, um, literally everything as far as we can tell. Staying in Australia, an Australian clinical lab says patient data was stolen in a ransomware attack. This affected med lab pathology and impacted 223,000 people. It includes Medicare numbers along with names, credit card numbers, CVVs, and individual medical and health records. Not for everyone. Exact numbers of who had what stolen vary, but are stated in the article. So this next one's really interesting. Iran's Atomic Energy Agency confirms a hack after stolen data was leaked online. So the attacker is known as Black Reward, and they have posted the data in their Telegram channel, which amounts to 27 gigs of data split up into 14 parts of compressed archives and contains 85,000 email messages. Allegedly, they have curated these messages to remove like spam and marketing emails and just any kind of that run of the mill stuff that nobody cares about. So this is 85,000 details or emails that contain, contain things like passports and visas of workers, power plant status, performance reports, contracts, technical reports, all kinds of stuff. The attackers also mentioned the, um, I'm so sorry, I didn't write her name down and I've forgotten it, but the, um, the woman who was recently killed in Iran that sparked all these most recent protests, uh, they mentioned her in their message to the victims. So this is possibly an act of hacktivism, but also that could just be for show. That could just be them trying to seem political when they're really profit motivated. We don't really know. So yeah, if we learn any more, we'll let you know. Hive claims ransomware attack on Tata Power. I like the way I said it, so I'm gonna just keep saying Tata. A subsidiary of the multinational conglomerate Tata Group, Tata Power is India's largest integrated power company based in Mumbai. It appears to include employee personal information. Uh, you know more about you know about this. It's national Adhar. ID, Aadhaar, Aadhaar numbers. Oh, okay. Tax account numbers, salary info, and more. It also includes engineering drawings, financial and bank bank. <laughs> baking no banking records and client information we had a little typo in our notes <laughs> i don't always proofread okay anyone who follows me on twitter knows this it's been a hot minute since we've had one of these amazon accidentally exposed an internal server packed with prime video viewing habits due to a password unprotected elastic search database um not not a bucket but i mean they're the same thing right they're basically all the same thing also gotta add it was named sauron the name of this database was Sauron. This contained 215 million entries, like the name of the show or movie being streamed, the device it was being streamed on, network quality, and subscription details, like if the person viewing it was a Prime member or not. Parler managed to accidentally expose most of its elite members' private email information in a message announcing Kanye West's takeover. Some context, we have Kanye West taking over Parler, and we have Elon Musk taking over Twitter. Parler sent out a mass email to their VIP users to inform them of Kanye West's plans to buy the platform. But, oh my god, classic mistake. They used CC instead of BCC. And I, I can laugh at, okay, I am going to laugh at this. I will say we actually have had a tech lore incident in the past where this happened on our end. So anyone can do it. But this is pretty embarrassing for a company with, of the size of Parler sending things out to like high level VIP users. So everyone saw everyone else's email addresses. Over 300 addresses were exposed, including the likes of Ta Ted Cruz, Donald Trump, Matt Gates, Madison Cawthorn. I don't even know some of these people. Tim Poole, journalists from the Epoch Times and One American News Network and more. They should hopefully be using simple login. Apparently not if everyone figured out that that was their email address. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, if they use simple login, no one would know who the hell it is. Our next one is a quick update. Twilio discloses another hack from June and blames voice phishing. So this took place prior to the big leak that we've been covering for weeks, the gift that just keeps on giving. This was much shorter and more limited in terms of what was accessed and the impact. And for the record, this was a discovery of the investigation. So they were investigating that big breach from, I think it was August or something like that. And um, while they were investigating, they found out like, oh crap, we actually got breached earlier than that. Um, personal conspiracy theory. I think this was probably the same attacker and they were testing the waters. It, it, just, it seems to check out. Like we mentioned before how it seemed like this was a very targeted, intentional thing. Um, the article doesn't say that. That's just my personal theory. 
We'll see. Pendragon car dealer refuses $60 million lockbit ransomware demand. They have over 200 dealerships in the UK, ranging from Ford, Nissan, Hyundai, to Porsche, Ferrari, and Aston Martin. The data has not been leaked yet, but we should assume that it will. The deadline has not arrived yet at the time of this recording. And that is it for data breaches. Yes, it is. With that, we'll move into companies, and we're going to start off with some great news. Meta has launched an ad campaign targeting iMessage, and they say that WhatsApp is far more private and secure. So this comes directly from Zuckerberg, or a quote, WhatsApp is far more private and secure than iMessage with end-to-end -end encryption that works across both iPhones and Androids, including group chats. With WhatsApp, you can also set all new chats to disappear with the tap of a button. And last year, we introduced end-to-end -end encrypted backups too, all of which iMessage still doesn't have, unquote. This was posted on Instagram with a, a picture that showed the whole like green bubble versus blue bubble debate. And then it just had a WhatsApp message bubble that just says private bubble. So these are all like technicalities. Like for example, you're, you're right. WhatsApp does offer encrypted messages that work across both iPhone and Android. You can set new chats to disappear with the tap of a button. With iMessage, I think you have to go into the settings to do that. And even then you only have like two options, like 30 days in one year. And to, to be fair, they, they, get, they win the encrypted backups part. But uh, you know, let's, let's not talk about metadata. We'll just table that discussion for now. Um, instead, let's focus on Signal, Wire, and Session, who all offer encrypted messages on both operating systems who offer disappearing messages and I think offer encrypted backups. Messengers like Threema and Matrix are also cross-platform but don't offer disappearing messages. And uh, thankfully, all of these options are not owned by an abusive privacy adverse company who regularly leaks your data and campaigns against your privacy rights while running commercials claiming that they do. That's all I got on that one. Yeah, you know, it's, it's actually really too bad that this comes from Meta because they bring up legitimate concerns about iMessage and It'd be awesome if this came from a legitimate company that had any kind of reputation because it might actually force Apple to do something about it. But I'm sure that uh, I'm sure the Apple execs saw this and they're like, <laughs> like, I know, right? I just fell out of their chairs laughing. Yeah, they're like, what's what's Mr. Metaverse trying to do now? Like, like well, they're probably just laughing their asses off. Like, I'm in a tough place because I want to laugh him off because Zuckerberg is such a meme at this point with everything Meta is doing. Um, and they're such a joke on so many levels. They're losing, and we're about to talk about this, how like they've lost, I think they're at their lowest val val valuation in like the almost the last decade. But like, there's still a very real possibility that um, the metaverse can happen and that it will succeed. And so I don't want to like laugh them off completely because they're still a real threat. And if we laugh them off entirely, then it, it's, it's only making them stronger, I think. So that segues perfectly into the next one. We already kind of talked about this, but Meta posts another revenue decline as investors voice Metaverse concerns. According to the article, Meta's revenue has been down 4% year over year. This recent decline is being partially blamed on inflation and Meta is promising a turnaround, particularly banking on the Metaverse. We didn't throw this in the notes, but actually there's one large shareholder of Meta who specifically like voiced their concerns directly to the company saying like they need to get their stuff together pretty much because like these are people who have like invested a huge amount of their money into this company and out of nowhere they're just rebranded to this random stuff so um if i was like a big investor in meta oh i'd be pretty upset with this right now too speaking of terrible companies exploiting people uber will start serving you targeted ads based on where you go quoting the article uber is rolling out a targeted ad system that will let companies serve ads to people in the uber app based on the specific places they have been unquote Uber is claiming that this data shared with advertisers will be aggregated and anonymized. So for example, it won't say John went to the bar on Main Street. It'll say like 500 people went to the bar on Main Street. But again, time and time again, we've always seen that location data in particular is pretty much impossible to anonymize. So, you know, that's an empty claim. They also say that users can opt out of quote, certain disclosures, unquote, whatever that means. They claim that they will not allow targeted advertising based on sensitive data like medical keywords, spiritual centers, and sexual orientation. Uber is not exactly having a great reputation right now. So personally, I don't really believe any of those claims, but that's what they're claiming. I did want to quickly, because we didn't throw it in the notes, but Twitter was officially bought out by Elon Musk. Um, several executives were fired. I just thought we should mention it because there's actually an important privacy thing here that I wanted to talk about. I don't care what people's stances are on Elon Musk or anything. It doesn't matter. The point that I wanted to really bring home here is that like when you're part of a company and you have they have your data and there's any kind of acquisition that's what that story speaks to for me right now if you sent anything in direct messages on twitter elon musk can see exactly what you've sent to anyone um this to me is like crazy because elon musk has definitely made enemies in his life and he can go ahead right now 
into their Twitter accounts and see everything they've sent to other people. Um, because Twitter's never implemented end-to-end -end encryption inside direct messages. Good reminder that end-to-end -end encryption is very important. And also, you can't control where your data gets eventually acquired. Actually, there was just a post on the Techler forum today where we talked about this. Like, Google acquires Nest. If you are a Nest customer, now it's Google. Google acquired Fitbit. If you're a Fitbit customer, now it's Google's data. And so there's all these different companies that get bought out by other big companies. So just something to keep on your radar. And that's kind of um, my little tidbit story for the day. And just to add on to that, like, that's not even conspiracy. That's written in all their terms of service. Like, I've never, even Proton, I think, probably, to be fair, I don't think I've checked theirs, but, like, literally every terms of service I've ever read, literally every single one, specifically says, like, if we get bought out, your data will be transferred to the parent company. Like, yeah. That's that's just industry standard. That's standard practice, yeah. Yeah, so, like, I'm not, like, throwing, I'm not, I'm not just making stuff up here on the spot. Like, this is real stuff. It's a real concern. If you had an Oculus, it's now a Facebook product, and Facebook has all the data for it. Um, Amazon has bought out several companies. Facebook has, Google has. I actually looked through this on Wikipedia. Like, each of these companies has bought out dozens of companies over the years. Okay, our next story. It's my turn to get on a soapbox with this one. Uh, TikTok's Chinese parent company reportedly intended to use the app to surveil specific Americans' locations. A recent report is claiming that ByteDance had planned to use the location data to track at least two specific American citizens. The report does not specify who these people were or what the nature of this tracking entailed, but it did say that they were not current or former ByteDance employees, so they were totally unrelated to the company. It's also unclear if the tracking actually took place or was simply planned. Now, here's where I'm going to get on my soapbox. TikTok replied by saying that this is impossible because the app does not collect precise location data on US users. However, TikTok's English privacy policy, which lists a legal address in the state of California where you can send your concerns and questions to, explicitly states that with permission, they access precise GPS location data. So this is where I'm gonna get on my soapbox. Why do companies always flat out insist on lying to us? Like, is it because they know that people don't care or they think that people aren't gonna check? I guess the, the, the bad parts of this story, like TikTok was trying to surveil people. It kind of blew right past me because I'm like, well, yeah, it's TikTok. I'm not going to tell you not to use TikTok because you're all grownups and you can make your own choices and do whatever you want. But I mean, at this point, if you're watching the show regularly, you know, you know what you're doing. All right, we're going to take a break from the, the unhinged stuff for at least one story. New Samsung maintenance mode protects your data during phone repairs. So we discussed this when it was uh, previously announced, but now it's actually launched. Um, what this is, is if you have a Galaxy device, you can put it into maintenance mode, which protects your data. So you can take it to a repair shop and the repair shop can still access things and still be able to test functions of the phone without getting access to your data, which is super cool. And it'd be awesome to see other companies get this functionality. The wait is over. DuckDuckGo for Mac beta is now open to the public. So for those of you who don't know this, DuckDuckGo has a browser. Previously, it was in closed beta. or they were only letting a certain number of users in and now it's open but only for Mac. They still have not released it for Windows. It comes with, quote, Duck Player, a YouTube player that helps protect your privacy, unquote, but still allows non-targeted ads. It comes with Bitwarden integration. It comes with automatic cookie pop-up handling, built-in integration with their email masking service, and more. They proudly say that their browser is not a fork, but was written entirely by their engineers and uses the public macOS API. It will be open source before it leaves beta, and they promise that a Windows version is still on the way. For those who've missed previous surveillance reports, you can probably do better. There's nothing inherently wrong with this browser. I guess it's great they're doing this. More browser options doesn't hurt anyone. This one I cannot be unhinged about because I actually really loved it. Brave Translate is Brave's own built-in translation, which boosts now supported languages from 15 to 108. This includes Chinese, Hindi, and Arabic. Full list is available currently only on Android and desktop as per usual, but iOS coming in the future. Nate apparently didn't have a great experience using this, translating a German article. I've been trying it with like Spanish. I just, I didn't even know this feature came out actually. And I tried it I'm like, oh, this is cool. And it worked pretty well. But um, I guess try it out, see if it works. Hopefully it improves if you're having issues with it. This one's real quick. Apple fixes new zero day used in attacks against iPhones and iPads. So for those of you who are Apple users, there's a new iPhone and iPad update. Apple says the flaw may have been actively exploited and it was reported by an anonymous researcher. I don't know if it's anonymous from them or anonymous from us, but it was an out of bounds write issue which could cause data corruption, app crashes, or code execution. So pretty serious. If you're an Apple user, make sure that you update. And if your device is not getting updates, you should probably consider switching to a new one ASAP because those security updates really matter. 
on the topic of Apple, a bug in Apple macOS Ventura breaks third-party security tools. They explicitly mention malware scanning and monitoring tools, but it's unclear exactly what else is affected. The article describes a workaround if needed, and it will be fixed in the next update, but Apple has not given a timeline. And our final company story, Reddit Onion Service Launch. Title really says it all. Reddit has launched an Onion Service. I know in the past, a lot of people say that using Reddit over Tor will get you banned. Because I used to get, them, get my accounts shadow banned all the time, and I think it was because I was putting a link in my bio as soon as I made the account. So I'd go fill out my bio, and I'd be like, thenewoil.org, or back then it was .xyz. And I think they thought that was spam, and so they were shadow banning it. So I don't think Tor alone is enough to get you banned. I think it's a combination of things. Research. We're going to start with a timing attack on WhatsApp Signal and Threema, which can reveal user location. So we're going to start by saying the site is a little sus, just so everyone knows. Their recommended VPNs include the usual offenders like Nord, Surfshark, and Express, kind of like Privacy Tools I.O., and they only include Proton out of the actual good VPNs. They harp on Nord hard, and they call a VPN crucial. So along with any site that does this, take what they say with a grain of salt. It doesn't mean the research is bad. It just means that at least what they're recommending is probably not the greatest thing out there. Regarding the actual research, a team of researchers has found that it's possible to infer the locations of users of popular instant messenger apps with an accuracy that surpasses 80% by launching a specially crafted timing attack. The trick lies in measuring the time taken for the attacker to receive the message delivery status notification on a message sent to the target. Because mobile internet networks and IM app server infrastructure have specific physical characteristics that result in standard signal pathways, these notifications have predictable delays based on the user's position. In other words, if someone is located in a certain place, it's going to take a certain amount of time for it to show that you that a message was delivered to that individual. And if you can time the exact amount of time that it takes a message to deliver, you can kind of try to guesstimate where someone's located up to 80% success rate. We saw this a while back with desktop. Someone could get your precise location even when using a VPN by using other characteristics of your connection. Surprisingly, they say this attack is most accurate on Signal at 82%, 80% on Threema, and 74% on WhatsApp, which reminds us that there is no perfect messenger. They recommend there actually are two very easy fixes to this. You can just disable read receipts, very simple fix, which stops the attack entirely, or you can use a VPN to increase latency and help reduce accuracy since you're going through a VPN server. Two of the three messengers are investigating possible fixes. We're going to assume it's Signal because I don't think Meta would even respond to something like this, but we could be wrong. Either way, two of the three messengers are investigating fixes. Threema has said they're considering randomized notification delays, but also pointed out that this attack is debatable in practice. Not everyone has their messenger open 24 seven and push notifications can add additional delays. There are a ton of things that can impact this. I assume if you're on a cell connection and there's not as good service from the cell connection, this is gonna impact this. So this seems highly targeted, highly sophisticated to pull off, not something many of you probably have to worry about, but it's still a very cool attack. And there's also very similar correlation attacks that are done over the Tor network. Again, this is all high threat model stuff, um, but it's still super cool to see. And it's hopefully we'll see some kind of mitigations in place. Otherwise, there's already two easy mitigations for people who really care about this. Our next story is, uh, I think, kind of a quick one. It says Apache Commons text RCE resemblance, resemblance to log for shell, but exposure risk is much lower. I'm going to quote the article. Apache Commons text performs text operations such as escaping, calculating string differences, and substituting placeholders in text with values looked up through interpolators. Fellow open source library Log4j is a Java-based logging utility. The vulnerability centers on an insecure implementation of the library's variable interpolation func yeah, interpolation functionality, namely that certain default lookup strings could potentially accept untrusted input from the remote attackers, such as DNS requests, URLs, or inline scripts, unquote. I'm not going to lie. All of that went way over my head. Um, but basically, yeah, Apache Commons text is um, a very common uh, tool, I guess. And basically, they have found a vulnerability that's very easy to exploit. It can have some very severe consequences, but it's it's not as severe as log for shell because it's not, I guess, it's not used quite as commonly, and therefore the risk is a lot lower. So if you're using Apache and you actually understood what all that stuff means, be sure to keep your eyes out for an update here in the near future. But thankfully, it sounds like this should not be anywhere near as much of a like running around with the hair on fire kind of thing that we saw last time with Log4j. So, Siri Spy, an iOS bug has allowed apps to eavesdrop on your conversations with Siri. 
In short, any app with access to Bluetooth could record your conversations with Siri and audio from the iOS keyboard diction feature when using AirPods or Beats headsets. This would happen without the app requesting microphone access permission and without the app leaving any trace that it was listening to the microphone. Apple does have mitigations in place for this, but this is still worth being aware of. Our next research comes from the markup. It says, journalists, investigate which neighborhoods in your city are offered the worst internet deals. I'm going to quote the article. We found that AT&T, Verizon, Earthlink, and CenturyLink disproportionately offered the worst internet deals to neighborhoods that were formerly redlined, uh, which basically means whose residents are lower income and have a higher concentration of people of color than other parts of the city. We examined actual internet offers to more than 800,000 addresses in 38 cities across the country. People in disadvantaged neighborhoods would be offered plans as high as $100 per megabit per second, while those in more affluent areas that have more white residents and had the best historical redlining scores were offered plans for less than a dollar per megabyte, megabit per second. The ultimate effect of these practices went beyond fairness. Those in disadvantaged neighborhoods were offered speeds so slow that they were denied the ability to participate in remote learning, remote jobs, and even family connection and recreation that are ubiquitous to modern life. A recent Pew survey, for example, showed that 90% of respondents saying that the internet has been essential or important for them personally during the coronavirus outbreak. Also, just so people know, um, at least my local library, not everyone's library is going to do this, but at least my local library offers free internet hotspots. You can just rent like them out. To, oh, to rent. Oh, Yeah, sweet. you just rent them out. I think they're a week and you have a free hotspot. That's mine. But again, not everyone's might do that. Next one. People really want smart cars to include cybersecurity labels. Survey finds. BlackBerry surveyed over a thousand US customers about IoT security. 56% are concerned about the security of their smartphone, smart home devices. 68% say security concerns prevent them from connecting to internet-enabled devices. I have a lot of doubts about that one, actually. Yeah, that sounds pretty high. That sounds very high. I, I would think the majority of people have IoT devices. I wonder how many of them realize what IoT means. That's, that's like how many of I'm them wondering. realize that like your smart TV counts as IoT. Yeah, or like your fridge and your. Like well, because I was going to say, I could see people saying, like, I don't connect my fridge or, you know, I don't connect. But, like, you know, I don't have an Alexa or something like that. But I'd be surprised if 68% of people said, I don't have a smart TV. That does seem kind of high. That, that's, that seems bizarre to me. But whatever. The most popular smart devices are speakers, doorbells, and vacuums. And respondents believe that speakers, doorbells, and thermostats are the safest devices <laughs> from a security perspective. 74%, see what I mean? Yeah. This, <laughs> uh, this is just such a weird poll. So 74% also said that proposed IoT labeling system um, should include smart cars, which we would both argue why not all modern cars because all of them bake in pretty much smart functionality nowadays. So I wanted to add on to that. Something that I just remembered... I've mentioned in the past, I have a law enforcement friend and he texted me out of the blue the other day to tell me that, uh, been meaning to talk to you about some information I got about vehicle tracking. Apparently most vehicles since 2016 have cellular transceivers and SIM cards. Police can subpoena AT&T with, uh, the VIN number for tower paying records. If you, here's the useful part. Cause I told him, I was like, yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. If you go to att.com slash plan slash in, in hyphen car hyphen Wi-Fi. You can plug in your VIN number and see if you have a cell transceiver. So I'm assuming that only works with cars that have AT&T, and I'm not sure what percentage of cars that is. I doubt it's 100%. But since we're talking about smart cars and cybersecurity and stuff, I just thought I'd throw that in there. That was something interesting I learned this week. Very cool. And then just one last really quick story. The headline says researchers find 633% increase in cyber attacks aimed at open source repositories. This is just another one of those headlines says it all and just worth having on your radar kind of stories we you know open source does not automatically equal equal secure and um there there's definitely a huge problem with supply chain and open source attacks right now so just be aware of that guys we're moving into politics silicon valley is starting to cave to european regulators meta has been forced to sell off giphy for those who don't know meta acquired giphy the, the gift service it's being forced to stop this acquisition by regulators in the uk not by the US, even though both Meta and Giphy are based in the US. Here's a quote, even though this particular decision affects only Meta, it may be an indication of how other big tech acquisitions will fare under the scrutiny of countries whose antitrust rules don't favor businesses as much as America's do. This marks the first time a global regulator has unwound a big tech acquisition, and it's an almost sure sign that it won't be the last. Our next story is also technically good news, it says France finds Clearview AI maximum possible for GDPR breaches. So France has fined Clearview 20 million euros, which is the maximum fine allowed. This is their third fine from France. 
and it comes after Clearview has basically ghosted France and refused to pay the other two fines. Uh, this particular fine is for violating Article 31, lack of cooperation. The article points out that it's entirely possible that Clearview will never pay any of these fines and will instead just take this as a warning to stay out of France. This is still a win for France, to be totally honest, because now Clearview is staying out of them. Kind of sucks for the rest of us, because I was really hoping Clearview was going to get screwed out of that money and hopefully go under. It's something, I guess. You know, we'll take our little wins here and there. Japan steps up push to get public buy-in to digital IDs. So Japan has stepped up its push to catch up to digitization by telling a reluctant public they have to sign up for digital IDs or possibly lose access to their public health insurance. The initiative is about assigning numbers to people. Similar to social security numbers in the US, many Japanese worry the information might be misused or that their personal information might be stolen. Some view the My Number effort as a violation of their right to privacy. Really good stuff. I'm, I'm glad to hear people talk about that. The article says that in Japan, fax is still common and many people still use cash. Many bureaucratic procedures still require in-person paper forms. Now the government is asking people to, people to apply for plastic My Number cards equipped with microchips and photos to be linked to driver's licenses and public health insurance plans. Health insurance cards now in use with a lack of photos will be discontinued in late 2024. People will be, will be required to use My Number cards instead. That has drawn the backlash with an online petition demanding a continuation of the current health cards, drawing more than 100,000 signatures in a few days. The article goes on to discuss some of the concerns various citizens express. So good job, Japan. Our next story comes out of Australia. It says tougher penalties for serious data breaches. I didn't catch his name, but this comes from a Australian politician's blog. He is proposing the Privacy Legislation Amendment Enforcement and Other Measures Bill 2022, which will be introduced, I think it was introduced this week, which will increase penalties originally set forth under the Privacy Act of 1988. Currently, the maximum penalty for serious or repeated privacy breaches is $2.22 million. But under the new law, it would be whichever is the greatest of $50 million, three times the value of any benefit obtained through misuse of information, or 30% of a company's adjusted turnover in the relevant period. It will also provide the Australian Information Commissioner with greater powers to resolve privacy breaches, strengthens the notifiable data breaches scheme to basically give the AIC more information about the breach, and gives the AIC and Australian Communications and Media Authority greater information sharing powers. Now, I'm not Australian. I don't know anything about how your laws and, and stuff work over there. But just knowing governments and politicians, this is almost certainly not enough. But it sounds like, at very least, a hell of a good start. Huge invasion of privacy, Kansas City... Kansas teachers denounce adding cameras in every classroom. On Tuesday, the school board reviewed the proposal to spend more than $6.7 million to add 1,600 cameras using federal COVID-19 relief dollars provided to schools to address the pandemic's effects. The board voted to hold a public meeting, both in person and virtually, to allow the community to provide input before making any decisions. The date for the meeting has not yet been set. The proposal says teachers could use the cameras to live stream and record lessons, which could be shared with students who are absent and students in classrooms where the district has been forced to hire long-term subs. Subs, because of the staffing shortages, could then watch the live lessons from the classrooms that have qualified teachers. This has drawn nearly universal criticism from teachers who fear both the privacy invasion and the harmful effects of a nearly fully digital education. So it's nice to see people speaking up about this. Also, COVID-19 relief dollars being used on this? Come on, pay the teachers more. Google sued over biometric data collection without consent. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton has sued Google for allegedly collecting and using biometric data belonging to millions of Texans without proper consent. The Texas AG says that Google allegedly used products and services like Google Photos, Google Assistant, and Nest Hub Max to collect over a vast array of biometric identifiers, including voice prints and records of face, ge uh, face geometry since 2015. This would be a violation of the state's Biometric Privacy Act, aka the Capture or Use of Biometric Identifier Act, which requires companies to get the con user's consent when collecting their biometric identifiers like retina or iris scan, fingerprint, voice print, or record or hand or face geometry. I think we've covered something similar to this before. Apparently, Texas does have a Biometric Privacy Protection Act. Google has not been following it, according to Ken Paxton. We'll keep you updated if anything comes out of that lawsuit. FTC is bringing action against the CEO of alcohol delivery company over a data breach. They are taking that rare step of bringing individual sanctions against the CEO of alcohol delivery company Drizzly for data privacy abuses. 
Following allegations that the company's security failures under his watch exposed the personal information of about two and a half million customers. This is a subsidiary of the ride hailing service Uber, and under the terms of the FTC action, they'll have to destroy unnecessary data, implement new data controls, and train employees about cybersecurity. In singling out the CEO, the FTO signaled it could use a wider range of tools to address data privacy abuses under the leadership of Chair Lena Khan, who was widely expected to bring tougher oversight of the tech industry. With that, we'll move into the free and open source section, and we've actually got a lot of good news this week. First up, podcast app Pocket Cast goes open source. Quoting the article, the Android and iOS apps are available now under a Mozilla Public License 2.0, a copyleft license that stipula stipulates all derivative projects or modifications have to be released under the same license, unquote. I'm told that the server source, co source code is still proprietary, but this is still a huge win as Pocket Cast is, quote, one of the most popular podcatchers outside of the big tech ecosystems of Google, Apple, and Spotify, unquote. This comes from Molvad, the VPN company. A security audit report for their app is now available. They partnered with this company. They did an audit. Everything came back great. We love audits. It makes the VPNs look better, and it's good stuff. Our next story also comes from Molvad. They have added V2Ray obfuscation support for their bridges. Today, we announced that we have added another obfuscation message, V2Ray, to some of our ST-booted bridge servers. V2Ray is a tool to help bypass restrictive networks. It is added as an option alongside ShadowSox on our bridge servers. I like this last part. In addition to adding V2Ray to some of our bridges, we have also converted the same bridge servers to run from RAM without any disk in use using our ST boot bootloader. So basically, um, they've added this censorship circumvention method, and they have also moved some of their servers to run from RAM, which is way better in protecting from physical compromise and attack. So good for them. All right, last open source article. Safings Portmaster 1.0 has been released. So it's now out of beta and it's in public release. For those who don't know what Portmaster is, I actually just interviewed the team over at TechLore recently. With that, we'll move into our Misfit section. And our first story says, Instagram deleted my account without warning and then refused to give me my pictures. So, I mean, the headline really says it all. He kind of walks through the, the whole story of how he found out his account was banned, the steps he took to try and recover it, so on and so forth. It's self-explanatory, so I want to focus on the lessons here. First lesson, these companies can ban you at any time. With, a, with or without reason, they are not required to listen to your appeals, and anything you upload becomes their property and not yours. They don't have to give it back to you, they don't have to get your permission to do anything with it, and they're also probably not deleting it. Second lesson, the author outlines how privacy laws are currently disorganized, and many users reported filing complaints in California using ra random California addresses, and it worked to get copies of their data back. So if you've been banned and you want your data, this is a potential option. Or third, in my opinion, just keep copies yourself. Facebook is not your photo backup, okay? I would even argue that Google Drive is not your photo backup because they have also banned people. Yes, we totally missed that story. We apologize for that, but these things happen. You got, you got to keep your own backups. You got to be in charge of this stuff yourself. So yeah, those are my takeaways from the story. This one's an interesting one. So deep fakes of celebrities have begun appearing in ads with or without their consent. Essentially, some deep fakes for advertisements were published. This included people like Elon Musk and other big celebrities, and they actually were never even told about these ads before they were run. So this really just uh, opens this whole new legal gray area of celebrities could struggle to contain their image, and people might not know what's actually from the celebrity and not from the celebrity. Kind of a spooky world we're moving to. So maybe in the, in the near future, I'll just officially say, I'm never gonna be in any videos ever again. I'm audio only. But then people will just deep fake the audio, so there's no winning. Our last misfit story, the headline says, I tried to keep my pregnancy secret. The author is Anya Prince, and she talks about how she tried to keep her pregnancy a secret, partially as an experiment just to see if it was even possible, but also because um, some of you may know, the first trimester, there's actually a really high likelihood that you're going to lose the baby for any number of completely natural, out of your control reasons. So a lot of parents will, or expecting parents, will wait until after the first trimester before announcing a pregnancy because, it, you know, if something goes wrong, they don't want people to show up and, you know, hey, how's the baby doing? And it's like, well, we lost the baby. So that's actually what ended up happening. I, I kind of hate to spoil it, but she ended up losing the pregnancy. And unfortunately, at some point in this experiment, she slipped up. Facebook figured out she was pregnant. And so while dealing with the grief of this, she also had to deal with Facebook being like, hey, here's a deal on diapers and stuff like that, reminding her, thanks, I lost a baby. I really wanted to share this one personally because just this week, actually, I had somebody ask me, a new coworker asked me like, why does privacy matter? And he was being genuine. He wasn't trying to be a dick. Like, well, why, do, why does it matter? He's, he's like, I want to know. Like, you're really passionate about this. Why should I care? And it's our gut reaction for a lot of us to go straight for things like government censorship and social media manipulation and this thing and that thing. 
And a lot of the time we forget these like really relatable common stories like this one, or like I've seen similar stories in the past of people who are uh, recovering alcoholics and they're getting ads for absolute vodka or you know, they're gambling addicts and they're getting ads for the local casino. And um, uh, one podcaster I followed was getting ads for Mother's Day when his mother had just recently passed away. So just kind of add this one to your arsenal about stories why privacy matters. You know, people need time to process things and deal with their grief and not be bombarded with reminders from big tech. All right, and we are finally done with the stories this week. I don't know how long this is gonna be after we edit it, but it's been like an hour and a half already. But we are here in the Q&A. And the first question is from Surprise Trapeze. There's two questions. The first one is, what are your guys' opinion on using A-Bind Blur? Now, oh, did they rebrand to Iron Vest? Um, let me quickly just check that. Yeah, so it is, it's now Iron Vest. So they rebranded into Iron Vest, good to know. So what is our opinion on Iron Vest as a backup for privacy.com and a masked phone number solution? I actually have never used Abine Blur or Iron Vest. I have used Abine's Delete Me service, but I've never used Blur before, um, mainly because it's proprietary. I'm um, not like the other ones aren't, but Blur, Blur is meant to be like a password manager that integrates with everything else. And nowadays, privacy.com integrates with like one password. I know that like Simple Login now integrates with Bitwarden. So you're just gonna have random integrations at different places. Um, people who have used Iron Vest slash Abine Blur said good things about it, but it's not something I've ever personally used or recommended. I don't know if Nate has ever used it. I used it back in the day as a password manager. And I think I try, I started using the phone, but then, then I got into um, my pseudo instead. I never used the card because I was always turned off by the relatively high fees. But I, I think you are right. I think it's good to have as a backup plan as a good um, backup if you're unable to use one of those other ones for some reason. I did notice towards the end of my time using it that it was getting blocked a lot more, um, like the email addresses were, but. And then the second question, okay, I had to really think about this one. You say you're physically disabled, so it's impossible for you to use hardware keys without assistance because you have to touch the hardware key and move your hand. I'm gonna introduce this option and it might not even work, um, but a lot of sites that support pass keys slash hardware keys allow you to use a phone. I don't know if a phone you can reach, but you might be able to keep a phone closer to your hand and it might be easier to use your phone instead of a hardware key. If not, TOTP is still okay. The biggest risk with TOTP is phishing attacks. So just be extra careful with phishing attacks and you can still use TOTP with your computer. I don't know if you have any other ideas there. I don't. That one I was actually gonna open up to the comments, like if anyone has any good suggestions or things to look into. Yeah, it is cool because now iOS has pass keys and Android, I think has had pass keys for a while. And so hopefully if you can reach your phone or you have a remote way of controlling your phone, you can always use pass keys on your mobile device instead. This next question I like, cause I have thoughts on. It says, if you could only implement one of these measures, which and why this one over the others? And the choices are a privacy respecting email, a VPN and a non WhatsApp messaging app. I actually, I think I know what you're going to say. I'm going to put my finger below the desk on what I think it is, but I'm a privacy curious. respecting email. No, really? what do you think I was going to say? Messaging messenger. App. Yeah. No. So here's, here's my logic and this is why. Um, so first of all, VPNs, I think are overrated as hell. We've been over that and I think they're, they're great. I love them. I use them, but I mean, realistically, they only do two things. They encrypt your traffic. They change your IP address. The ones we recommend do DNS filtering, which is also still helpful. But again, it's still, they don't do any blocking. They don't do any tracking. They don't do any, any of that stuff. Messaging apps, I think are actually also kind of overrated, especially with how many people keep pumping out new ones constantly. Like, let's be real. Okay. Like. I use Signal. I have all of my close friends and family using Signal, but at the same time, like we don't really send anything that sensitive. And for the record, privacy is a human right. I'm not saying like, oh, I have nothing to hide, but if I could only pick one, I don't really send anything that sensitive. We do occasionally send, uh, you know, uh, a password, hey, like what's the Netflix login? Well, we use Bitwarden for that kind of stuff, but you know, every once in a while, like if it's a one-off password for some reason, we'll send that, we'll send, um, you know, like credit card information, uh, what's your pin, stuff like that. You know, if she borrows my card to go to the store, things like that. But the email, in my opinion, is I think where you're gonna get the most bang for your buck because you can reset all your passwords via email. Um, I get like bank notifications. I get medical notifications. I get, um, you know, work notifications, like uh, pay stubs. I get all kinds of things in email that are really sensitive 
that I really don't have a lot of control over that I can't say like, don't send, like I can't tell my bank, like message me my bank balance via signal. They, they won't do it, they can't do it, it's not possible. Um, same thing with my doctor. I can't tell my doctor like, hey, send me that automated appointment reminder via signal. Like, I don't know, to me an email is where you're gonna get the most bang for your buck out of those three if you can only pick one. Obviously, I, I'm thankful I don't have to pick one, but if I could only pick one, it would be the, the encrypted email provider, hands down. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, um, definitely all good points, and I think you're going to get different answers for this. Oh, the, of course, totally. The reason why I would pick a messenger instead of an email, first, for me, the email, um, regarding data collection, let's say you're using Gmail, the main concern with using Gmail is Google's collecting data about you, but at least it's centralized to Google. And there's lots of things you can do within your own Google account that you can compartmentalize things within Google reasonably okay. It's still not great, but um, I'm more concerned because for me, where my entire security and privacy journey starts is having a safe space. If we're getting a client, if I'm doing anything, if I need to message a friend, like I need a safe space to chat with them just like I would in real life. And for me, that's always a messaging app. Um, I don't want email to be my safe space. I want a messaging app to be my safe space. You talked about sharing passwords and that's like something that like realistically I have to do with people sometimes. And so I don't, I would rather use email than like an encrypted Proton email, which is still a nice feature. Either way, I think the email or the messaging app are good options. I, I don't think a VPN is a good choice for a lot of people. To add to your argument, um, Google actually stopped scanning your emails for advertising back in like 2016. They still scan your emails. They're mostly looking for malware and um, like abuse material. The other problem too is like email does have some inherent issues that even if you have a privacy respecting email provider, like you can still address most of them, which is why like I can't stand when people go like, don't, you might as well just use Gmail because Proton can't deal with this like one issue with email. And it's like, yeah, but they're still solving a lot of other problems with email in my eyes. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of why I said email because like at least Proton or Tutanota or whoever I go with, their employees can't see my emails. You know, I don't have to worry about a rogue employee stealing my bank account information, or I don't have to worry about uh, a cyber criminal who manages to get through and get a data breach stealing my content. Like, I don't have to worry about that. Fun question. Thank you, Philip. It is a really fun question. I like that one when I saw it. I was like, that's a good one. And our final question comes from Arcadia, who says, I have a new job that's worked from home. I've always worked in an office, so this is all new to me. I've heard to use your guest Wi-Fi for office connections. Do you have other tips for work from home security? I actually do have on the new oil, it's the newoil.org slash Wi-Fi hyphen guide. You can also find it if you just go straight to the homepage, the newoil.org and scroll down a little bit. It's listed under quick start guides, home network. I have a whole thing about how to set up your home network in like, you know, picking a good password, changing the, the Wi-Fi name, setting up VLANs and stuff like that. I do not work from home, but I do have a company device. I did put it on the guest Wi-Fi. I think that's really the biggest thing. If you're allowed to use a VPN, put it behind a VPN, um, just so that way they don't get your exact home address. And just general compartmentalization, you know, don't use, don't do personal stuff on company devices, like not even simple stuff, like don't check your email. Um, I logged into Spotify today, that was honestly probably a bad idea. But just just little things like that. Just try, try, to, try to treat it as a completely separate individual. Different, different guest Wi-Fi, all unique passwords, um, don't put any personal accounts on there, all that kind of stuff. Yes, what I what I tell my clients, there's a degree of compartmentalization scale. It starts with like a different browser profile in the same browser. So like in Brave, you can have two user profiles. That's like a bare minimum. From there, it's just having a second browser for maybe work, work versus personal browser, like maybe Firefox is for this, Brave is for that. Then from there, it's a user account. So multiple user accounts on the same device. From there, it's a virtual machine. And from there, it's just separate devices. That's kind of the scale of compartmentalization in my eyes. It's, it's all about like threat modeling and like how convenient you want things to be. But just if people need a little bit help of getting started with compartmentalization, that seems to help people a lot. That's it for this week. Can eight 40, R RTX 4090 GPUs crack your password? Kind of. Is WhatsApp more secure than iMessage? Maybe, maybe not, but it's, it's the wrong fight to pick. And Reddit got a Tor Onion site, which is really exciting. Again, Patreon people, oh my gosh, your contributions mean so much to us. It allows us to keep this going for free. It's awesome to see us grow and we're not far away from hitting 100 patrons. You can help us do that and we super appreciate it. 
and it'll bring me one step closer to being Dictator Henry. If you're contributing to the, the Dictator Henry cause, you should probably use Monero though, because Monero is uh, privacy friendly first and it's just a one-time contribution. And we see all of those and we very much thank all of you. Thanks for listening to Surveillance Support. The final thing we want to ask you to do is share the podcast around, make sure you subscribe, and definitely give us a rating if you're listening from a platform where that's allowed. I actually just checked out our Apple Podcasts platform, and you are leaving some amazing reviews, and I just love seeing that. So thank you, everyone. We have like a perfect five-star review. Thanks again for listening. See you next week.